Hey guys, what's up? This is David Patrick Carey with Church of the Eternal Logos. And today I want to speak to you guys about anatheism and the returning to God after God. Now this video is basically a rebuttal to Richard Kearney's popular book, Anatheism, Returning to God After God. It actually is Richard Kearney who popularizes this term. However, in this video, what I want to discuss is how the paradigm, the worldview, the presuppositions that Kearney is arguing from are exactly in direct opposition to what we discuss on this channel, Logos Theology, the returning that a lot of us are going through a movement, a shifting from what would be deemed a sort of spiritual but not religious or progressive worldview within rooted within the liberal Western tradition towards something much more traditional, uh, rooted within Christianity and its understanding of epistemology and ontology and anthropology, um, especially Logos theology. So what I want to talk about is how this book, despite being very popular, um, its immense perennialistic take, its pragmatic epistemology, its a phenomenological approach to, to God, all of which stand in a sort of opposition to what we try to do on this channel and the phenomenon that I think a lot of us are going through. So even in my previous video, I highlighted Logos Rising and Justin Bieber, PewDiePie and Kanye West as sort of indicators of culture shifting and the recognition of Christianity in certain ways, which eventually are going to lead people to more traditional morality and understanding of the world. So what I want to discuss is this book, but also why I think it's in opposition to what we do on this channel and what a lot of us are going through. So to begin, Richard Kearney is a very prominent philosopher. He's an Irish philosopher over at Boston College. And this book was written in 2010, 2011. So it actually, uh, my argument would be, it was written before what we're seeing this sort of cultural uh, shift that um, I certainly think I'm not trying to include the president, Donald Trump, or anything like this, but I think 2016, uh, 2015, 16, 17 has, has been the shifting point in a lot of people's lives in terms of a re-recognition of traditionalism, a questioning of the cultural values that are kind of being shoved on us, which is a sort of relativism, man becoming God, all these things that we discussed in previous videos, magic, paganism, pantheism, you know, worship of nature through climate change, all this stuff, a new religion, which includes a new morality and ethics, that a lot of the stuff that's kind of being pushed on us and forced upon us by the oligarchical institutions is sort of embedded with what he is trying to present to us and a re-recognition of God. So, in this book, for example, he absolutely does away with metaphysics, which metaphysics are essential to what we talk about in this, uh, on, on this channel, you know, logos, logoi, all these things, understanding what the logos is, how that, uh, works in terms of a worldview, the essence energy distinction, all these things are critical to our metaphysical understanding of the world and God and all this stuff. But he also, um, he's essentially kind of picking up on the Frankfurt school tradition and, and there's no doubt that he's a critical theorist. So this is kind of a whole another bag of worms, but if you guys are familiar with the Frankfurt School and the, which was a early 1900s academic kind of circle over in, in Germany that was basically a new critical understanding of Marxism and then using social theories to insert this new worldview uh, as a sort of academic critical lens upon the Western world. So a lot of what I dislike about the academy is its immense embeddedness within the critical theory of the Frankfurt School. So he is absolutely working out of the critical theory. And one of the things that the Frankfurt School was trying to do through their criticism of capitalism and then uh, Marxist-Leninism, even though they were pretty much Marxist, they just, uh, you know, it had a new valence uh, their, their, their critical theory had a different valence, but it was a sort of Marxism, though they were critical. They're critical of Marxism, Leninism. 
So <clears throat> what they wanted to do, one of the things was a re-enchantment of the world. And this goes back to Max Weber and his disenchantment of the world, which I think is an accurate critique. So Max Weber, who wrote the Protestant work ethic and talked about how capitalism is sort of rooted within the Protestant worldview, which I pretty much agree with him. I actually do agree with him. And I think that one of the ways that that is evident, of course, if you read his book, he makes a strong case for it through, uh, you know, the development of Protestantism, Calvinism, all this stuff. But how the spiritual but not religious is a sort of consumerism. And to me, the spiritual but not religious and it kind of becoming the largest singular religious denomination in America is symbolic of the kind of movement Protestantism is within the sphere of Christendom and how its plethora and its different variations allow for a sort of new consumeristic approach to religion and how you can choose is this church or this church or this church, you know, because they have the rock band and this one's kind of hip. No, this one's more traditional. And this lack of sort of a unifying body or consistency that you would see in orthodoxy, uh, Catholicism to a degree, even though Catholicism has a lot of variations to term their orders and stuff like this. And then maybe Anglicanism, although now you're into Protestantism and so, um, you know, Maybe not Anglicanism, but you can see the traditionalism there within Anglicanism. What I'm trying to point at is the spiritual not religious and how they appropriate from all these different religious traditions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, uh, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, whatever it is, paganism, shamanism, um, is reminiscent of the capitalistic, consumeristic impulse that has been moving through Protestantism and now has emerged in a sort of spiritual but not religious where this consumeristic tendency is still at play. So I do agree with Weber to that degree. And I also agree with Weber in the disenchantment of the world. This is one of his big theories that the Industrial Revolution, capitalism, um, has has altered scientific rationalism, has kind of altered the way in which we view nature or the world and has disenchanted it because, I mean, so... I disagree in the terms that this leads to the idea of God of the gaps and how science is sort of filling in places and therefore theology has to kind of maneuver around science because it's giving answers that uh, are radically altering theology or something like this. I, I, I disagree with that. However, I agree with the general tendency of Western civilization, the liberal tradition post-enlightenment, has been a continual disenchantment of previous things that we found valuable and sacred. So the Frankfurt School in the early 1900s, one of the things that they wanted to do was figure out a way to re-enchant the world. And this is exactly what he's picking up on. So this anatheism for him, one thing that is directly in opposition to us is he claims essentially you have to do away with God. So it... (laughs) I know this is a sort of play. So he's talking about returning to God after God, yet he doesn't allow for any transcendence of deity. In fact, he argues multiple times in opposition to deity. Um, He claims that the transcendent, omnipotent God has been a ruinous influence. And I will read that full excerpt from this book. That's page 53. But... uh, He claims that any sort of transcendent, omnipotent, self-sufficient deity is uh, is dramatically negative in terms of our worldview and has been an immense negative in terms of history. So he is arguing, well, the the reason he believes it's an immense negative is because he has this erroneous idea that theodicy, so theodicy is just a term a theological term, trying to account for the existence of evil, right? And so you'll see a lot of atheists try to talk to religious people and be like, oh, 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 you believe, you believe in God. Yeah, well, then why does evil exist? Or how, how did the, how did, you know, the deaths in Soviet Russia exist? How in communist China and Nazi Germany, you think God willed all that? Well, it's a, it's a really dumb claim because we believe in free will and therefore evil exists in the absence of God or the absence of following God's will, which is the divine order, which is the logos, right? So for us, well, we have the free will to either follow God's order, the logos, Jesus Christ, or we don't. And anytime you choose or, or behave in a way that is inconsistent with God's will or God's divine order or traditional morality, well, that is what we would call a sin. So it is not, um, 
theodicy is not a big problem for us. Theodicy is just the fact that human beings have free will and therefore evil exists because humans choose evil, sinful things consistent with their own personal desire and will. This is what magic is all about, cre- you know, performing rituals, doing things to acquire uh, things that you want, your own pleasures, your own fantasies, whatever you would like to manifest in the world, you can do that through sort of magical conjuration and the help of spiritual entities, which Christianity recognizes and I think is the underlying default religious position that's trying to be pushed by oligarchical institutions. It's sort of this uh, naturalistic paganism that's undergirded by real magic, I would argue. But um, he feels because the Odyssey, because if evil exists, therefore it disproves a transcendent, omnipotent God, is absolutely anti-theological. I mean, despite this guy being a a very prominent philosopher and, and recognized by, you know, many around the world, it's almost laughable when he tries to do theology. So that's just one example. Now, this whole book is a sort of what I would call, what I would describe it as the, the general religious worldview he's trying to paint as a sort of atheistic progressivism with God found in the world through experiences of awe. So that's basically what he wants is that God, the transcendent deity, has to be dead and that divinity or the sacredness of the world is encountered, and that's why he uses such a phenomenological approach, is encountered through direct experience with everyday life, and that awe, that uh, immense feeling, is where we would encounter with God or the sacred or something like that. So, um, and you can see this, you can see how this is a sort of continuation of this placing epistemology or truth within a sort of emotionalism, right? And, and that's part of this whole critical tr- tradition. Um, of course, not all the, th- the theorists, but one of the critical theorists that he uses a lot is Jürgen Habermas, who has, he does a lot of work on language and uh, speech, stuff like that. But um, one of the things that he talks about over and over is this sort of doubt how how what he needs what he's putting forth is because we have to do with this transcendent deity what we need then is a sort of religious atheism of doubt and then we we cross this bridge of atheism to a sort of not theism but a new spirituality a new religiosity by way of our phenomenological experience with all now he doesn't specifically say all uh you know throughout the book but that's what he is talking about and um so let's see here. Um, this so one of the things I wrote down is the whole book is framed that we must abandon any certainty for acceptance of continual doubt, and this is reiterated multiple times throughout this book is that we have to live in a continual state of doubt because it's through doubt and skepticism that uh, a fuller understanding emerges. Now, this cer- there certainly isn't any sort of foundationalism, but uh, uh, this whole this whole book is it well okay let, let's get to some of the perennial I have sections here that I want to read through so I, I might do that instead but um, one of the phenomenologists that he uses quite a bit is uh, Merleau Ponty uh, he's a French phenomenologi- phenomenologist um, very prominent within the kind of the modernist tradition uh, he has interesting claims one of the things that Kearney talks about in this book, which is just absolutely ridiculous, is that Christianity, because we have a transcendent deity, is therefore a sort of a cosmism. Okay, so a cosmism. What am I? I I'm saying a c o s m i s m. A cosmism, and a cosmism is essentially the opposite of what we would call pantheism, where God is the created world. A cosmism says, okay, God is transcendent, and therefore the physical world is an illusion. Now, anybody with any little bit of knowledge of Christian theology knows that we don't believe creation is an illusion. We might believe in the fall. We believe that, you know, God even had to take physical form to uh, provide us with a sort of outline, a sort of message, so we can then return back to the transcendent All-Father or how we can get in line with the Logos, the divine order. 
but we certainly don't believe the natural world or created world is an illusion. And he says, because we believe it's an illusion, he uses this as another example of why we have to do away with any sort of transcendent deity. Now, this is ridiculous. Now, if you want to talk about uh, Maya in terms of Hinduism and Buddhism, there you can get into a sort of understanding of an illusion of the created world that would be more consistent with what he's trying to do. However, what he's trying to do is he already has an endpoint, and he's trying to bring all theology and religion back to his endpoint. And that's why he uses such a perennialistic approach. He uses a pragmatic approach to truth. Uh, in an excerpt that I'll, I'll read real quick, he talks about how truth isn't some abstract thing that we, we discover. Truth is what we do which is basically the definition of truth from the pragmatic tradition. Pragmatism is the sort of philosophical export from America, um, starting with Charles Sander Peirce, and then, of course, William James, and then John Dewey is one of the more uh, modernist figures within the pragmatic school that's very popular. Now, um, this sort of pragmatic understanding of truth is really just another form of relativism because what, from my opinion, the way I would describe epistemology within the pragmatic tradition is that it's really just a functionalistic relativism. So truth is whatever is functional uh, or convenient or adequate for that particular instance. And, the, and so from the fr pragmatic understanding, because the world is continually changing, therefore truth must be continually changing because truth is always reflective of what is functionalistic and what is appropriate for that place, time, and setting. So pragmatism itself, which sadly is the major export of America, and you can see how relativism is rampant within our own society because this is the undergirding philosophical understanding it within our culture is a sort of pragmatism. Um, and it is, in, to a degree, in opposition to, um, to Christianity. So he is rooted within the pragmatic tradition, and then he uses the phenomenological approach, as I already mentioned, as the main interaction between you and God. So there is no sort of logos theology where we are interacting with the divine mind and that through reason and logic we can start to make arguments, debate other people, and find through logic God's direct or ideal order. And that therefore through the logoi of the logos we can start to understand God and the logos is Christ, so it's through Christ that we can actually understand the transcendent Father. He totally rejects this, and he actually, at one point, he uses the instance of when Christ is being crucified, and he, you know, uh, kind of moans, uh, you know, I, I've, I'm misquoting this exactly, but essentially, God, why have you forsaken me, or Father, why have you forsaken me? He uses this as an instance to show how ridiculous the omnipotent, transcendent Father is, because even his own son he abandons, something like this, which, again is a total misunderstanding of Christian theology um, because he believes Christianity is a cosmism, is a cosmic. I know that's a weird word. Um, therefore, Christianity is nihilistic. This is literally what he's arguing, which from our perspective is totally ridiculous, right? How can... For us, who actually return back to Christianity through Logos theology, through an a acceptance or an interest within traditionalism, I know for me personally, but I would argue for a lot of you guys, it has actually been a very meaningful and has brought a lot more meaning back to our daily lives and the way we approach things and how we understand our own morality and how we treat people. And so this idea that Christianity is nihilistic is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, that's crazy. I don't even know how you could get to that point. But again, being rooted in the critical theory, being rooted in modern philosophical tradition, being rooted in the liberal paradigm, pragmatism, perennialism, you can see phenomenology, you can see why he is doing kind of what he's doing in terms of his academic project. Now, he uses a bunch of different scholars. I mean, he, this book is very well written. So I highly, I, I do say it, it's very, very well written and it's very well referenced. And this guy is a, you can tell he's a philosopher. He's read a lot. He knows a lot more than I do in terms of various individuals within uh, philosophy. You know, one of the people that he talked about quite a bit that I need to read more on is Kierkegaard. Um, I 
have not really read Kierkegaard much at all and don't really know a whole lot about Kierkegaard. So that's one thing that I need to do for my own. But he talks about um, Julia Kristeva. He uses her. And in fact, I think that's who he wrote his second book with, The Art of Anatheism with. Now, Julia Kristeva, she's another post-structuralist, French intellectual. Uh, she's a communist. She's a feminist. And she's a big proponent of critical theory. Now, there, again, and whenever you hear critical theory, that's rooted back to the Frankfurt School. And if you're not familiar with the Frankfurt School, just type that in YouTube or Google and you can learn a little bit more about it. And it's the Frankfurt School that's essentially hijacked the humanities and uh, the academy. And this is, I mean, it's more complicated than this, but the sort of dialectic or the tension you're seeing within higher education between the STEM programs and the humanity is rooted within STEM having, having a sort of worldview in which numbers, language, it really does map onto reality. There's real truth. There's ideal form, engineering, technology. All this stuff is based on these presuppositions where then at the other side of the academy within the humanities, they're basically trying to do away with all these things. Now, like I said, critical theory and the critical theorist tradition uh, is a little bit more complicated than that. You know, postmodernism is certainly takes critical theorist understandings, but then... Um, it's sort of a new strand of all this stuff, but still emerging out of French French intellectuals where a lot of this stuff comes from, even though the Frankfurt School comes from Germany. So um, he references Julie Kristeva, but then he also uses, um, you know, like one of the ways that he talks about how God is dead. So, you know, Nietzsche is famous for saying this, and he, he references Nietzsche multiple times in this book, and he tries to equate almost Nietzsche's will to power as the archetype of the uh, Christian God is that somehow it's always trying to will to power and therefore because it's a will to power and therefore evil exists, God can't exist because look at all the evil. It's really, really poor theology. But at one point he talks about the Holocaust and talks about how God is dead because the Holocaust occurred and he references multiple Jews talking about God uh, from there. And then he goes into uh, Levinas, uh, he goes into Derrida, um, both of which are Jews. He goes and then uh, he goes into Bonhoeffer, who's a famous Christian theologian from the uh, 20th century and uh, Bonhoeffer was known for his sort of religionless Christianity, which was certainly picked up by the liberal progressive end of Christianity and, and the theological uh, theology that's happening in the academy. And so you can see this religionless Christianity. Of course, that's what he's promoting. I mean, he's trying to do away with God and essentially just root spirituality in phenomenology of everyday world. And then he uses Paul Ricoeur. Now, Paul Ricoeur is very prominent. He was a Protestant. He's a very prominent uh, theorist, if you will, within the academy because of his hermeneutical approaches. So he did a sort of hermeneutical phenomenology in which one of the things he's famous for, and you guys may have heard of, is called the second naivete. And his second naivete is a sort of hermeneutical approach to text in which you abandon everything you previously know about it. So the author's background, his biological or biographical information, maybe the historical context of the text, anything like this, you you do a second naivete where you are naive to all those things and you take a second reading where the symbols of the text then are reflective of yourself and they're educated you on your own self, and therefore that's where the meaning of the text really is. You can see how that is is a sort of postmodern relativism, where we're now we're, reading, we're, we're rooting meaning totally in the individual, and there's not meaning or truth out there in the objective world. Paul Ricoeur is very popular within the academy, and even though he's not what you would consider a postmodernist or anything like that, you can see how his hermeneutical approach to phenomenolog uh, his hermeneutical phenomenological approach is one consistent with what he's trying to do in his book but allows for the individual understanding of meaning to become primary which is sort of like the the postmodernism that your truth is is my truth, you know, we're, we have different truths, but every truth is equal, and therefore, because everybody has their own truth, objective truth doesn't really exist. You can see how, even though he's not a postmodernist, Paul Ricoeur, 
his hermeneutical approach kind of leads to that understanding of the world. And that is why he's so popular within the academy. So he uses Paul Ricoeur, he uses Bonhoeffer, Derrida, Levinas, uh, Marlou, Ponty. These are the people that he references over and over, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche. So I wanted to go through here and highlight um, my contentions with this book. So, for example, here is the section where he's discussing a sort of pragmatic truth, okay? So, we are speaking here in some of the moment of truth as troth, where we do not know the truth, but we do the truth. Facere veritatum, as Augustine put it, orthopraxis precedes orthodoxy, trust precedes theory, and action precedes abstraction. Now, I totally disagree, you know, disagree with this understanding of what truth is and this idea that uh, action precedes abstraction. Um, there's interpretations of that, I guess I could get on, but I, what I feel like he's trying to do is, again, root truth uh, in action, which is related to pragmatism and uh, phenomenology, right? So truth is in something we do, whereas in our understanding, we have a transcendent deity that constructed the world through the logos, and through the logos and the logos, our metaphysical understanding, uh, we have a divine mind, and it's through our own noose in which we can encounter that divine mind and actually understand truth and understand the abstractions which then present themselves in physical form. So it does have a Platonic element, although as Christians, we're not Platonist in any way, um, but you see how that is in direct opposition. And then him trying to throw Augustine in there is trying to, you know, use Christianity against itself. And, and he does this over and over and over. Um, here's a, another example. Um, this is about the ruinous influence of the omnipotent deity. So this is page 53. He says... So suffice it now to note that the concept of God as absolute monarch of the universe stems from a literalist reading of the Bible, along with unfortunate misapplications of a metaphysics of causal omnipotence of self and self-sufficiency. So a misapplication of metaphysics of causal omnipotence and self-sufficiency. So it's a misapplication to say that there, must, there has to be a creator outside creation that exists for eternity and that any created category, because it's dialectic, can't describe this deity that's a misapplication of metaphysics. Uh, okay, let's go on. This has led to the ruinously influential notion of theodicy. Like I said, theodicy is the idea of the existence of evil and accounting for the existence of evil, which is pretty account easily to do within the Christian paradigm because we have free will, and therefore we can choose to not do God's order, and the absence of God is evil. That's, where, that's how evil exists, is the absence of God, or the absence of God's will, or God's divine order. So, um, this has led to the ruinously influential notion of theodicy, namely the belief that God as sovereign, as immutable emperor of the world, exercises arbitrary and unlimited powers over his creatures. Everything, even the worst horrors, could thus be justified as some divine will, the ultimate will to power. And uh, <laughs> you see what he's doing there, and it's just so nonsensical. Uh, it, it, I can see why intellectuals like this book is because he referenced, you know, it's very deep. It's very uh, rich with philosophy, you know, with academic history and references and stuff like that. Um, but it's, it's essentially just painting the presuppositional paradigm that the academy already works in, this sort of relativistic... Uh, uh, modernist liberalist tradition and <laughs> uh, it's just so funny um, okay let's see here uh, here it is so now we're moving to the disenchantment aspect that he's talking about. And like I said, the re-enchantment. So the dis disenchantment is a critique from Max Weber of the Western society, which to a degree I absolutely agree with. And to me, the disenchantment is the doing away or moving away from Christ traditional Christian theology. This is just my opinion. You don't have to agree with that. But uh, what he says here is, strictly speaking, then, 
anatheism is neither anti-theism nor anti-atheism. Oh, okay. This middle category where essentially you take no position. Uh, and it's not, it's not theism, definitely, because he wants to do away with God. Because for him, God's already dead. And nor anti-atheism, but a form of post-theism that allows us to revisit the sacred in the midst of the secular. Post-theism. Either God exists or it doesn't. Like, this, this, this is such academic gobbledygook that this is what's so frustrating. And this is why I don't want to work in the academy. I want to get my PhD, but I want to create a career online where I can talk about these topics to you guys, basically what I'm doing here, although I'm not making any money whatsoever for this, but eventually create a career where I can do what I would do in the academy, but online, because this is absolute nonsense, and this is exactly what the academy is all about. It appreciates the candor of enlightened critiques of religion and acknowledges Max Weber's diagnosis of the disenchantment of modernity. Um, so what he's trying to do with this book is then re-enchant modernity. And basically all he's saying is, oh, well, truth is pragmatic. And uh, what we can do is phenomenologically experience all. And that, therefore, that's basically like religion. That's ridiculous. Um, what else do I have here? So here's a portion. Is this the... And here's another thing that he mentions is uh, um, anatheism does not say the sacred is the secular. It says it is in the secular, through the secular, and toward the secular. Now, again, the secularism, even though it has aspects that I might agree with, has allowed for the co-opting of traditional values, absolutely. And, and at this point, I think we would have been better off if we made English the official language and Christianity the official religion of this country, and that this kind of uh, Masonic secular experiment, well, we see what it is now, and it's basically degeneracy, and that is American culture. American culture, American culture is everything that is degenerate, and I would argue that it promotes the most degenerate I mean, it is the source of degeneracy in the world. Not that other countries don't have it. Of course they do. But they don't celebrate it like we do with Hollywood and the media and all this stuff. So uh, not a strong critique there, in my opinion, that somehow anatheism, it's not, sec it's, not, it's not secularism, but it moves us in the right direction of secularism. Again, retarded. Here's a point where he's talking about the anti-God squad. And at, a, at another point, it's <laughs> he think he says that. Uh, oh, here I'll just read the whole section. Okay. This point is worth bearing in mind when considering recent writings by the so-called anti-God squad. Dawkins, Dennett, and Hitchens spend much of their time denouncing the diseases of believers without acknowledging the complexity of belief. They invoke the certainties of science against the faith, the falsities of faith, but not appreciating that genuine faith has never have never expressed itself with certainty, but always through a cloud of unknowing. So here he's trying to say that real faith is doubt. Again, it, no, that's not the case whatsoever. The wise person, as Socrates taught us, is one who speaks truth precisely because he knows he does not know. Now, of course, the... What he's doing there, he's making an epi ep epistemic claim to know something, to know that you don't know is still to know. And this is the same thing you see when somebody who's a relativist make a truth claim that, or try to say that no, relativism is true. Well, how can you make a truth claim? If, you see, it's, it's totally contradictory and sort of what he's doing there, although I, I understand that the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Uh, I agree with that. But... Uh, he says, a teaching that we noted finds its anatheistic equivalent in the famous uh, Docta Ignor Ignorantia in Nicholas of Cusa. But in addition to the practice of scientific negation adopted by critics of religion, one sometimes finds the dubious use of bias to attack bias, the deployment of a biological term like virus to indiscriminately describe all theists, I think, is disingenuous. Really? You think that calling people who are theists, or calling theism a virus and describing all theists as essentially infected, disingenuous? Wow, that's a real strong moral stance there you take, Richard Kearney. It's, it's, 
This is re re ridiculous. Oh, and then here is the last little thing that I want to read. Um, because I didn't want to make this video too long, and it's already going on a little bit longer than I was expecting, but he is trying to talk about the word. So here he actually brings up the word. Obviously, this is the English translation of Logos. And he's saying, well, oh, if the word exists from the beginning, as in the beginning, you know, was the Logos, well, then that means hermeneutics must have existed from the beginning. And he roots this within Talmudic understandings. Like, we care shit about the Talmud. Really? So, listen to this. <clears throat> If the word was in the beginning, so was hermeneutics. There is no word that is not interpreted, something well known by the Talmudists who taught that there are ten meanings to every line of the Torah. Uh, essentially, legalese, this is ridiculous. This is, again, the rejection of objective truth, and that's why you know the Talmudic Jewish tradition in this idea of Judeo-Christianity is absolutely ridiculous. Western Europe, or Europe in general, Western and Eastern Europe, is based on Christian values that, yes, uh, move from the Judeo tradition, the Hebrew tradition, but modern-day Judaism is basically in opposition to what we support and value within Christianity. Um, a view shared by the gifted hermeneutists like Ibn Rashid and Augustine. So again, he's using Augustine to try to flip Christianity. Now he's trying to say that the word equals hermeneutics and in equals infinite interpretations, which is where postmodern comes from. It comes from literary theory and this idea that you can read a text and you can do away with the intentions of the author, and therefore you can read the text and interpret it however you want and, and create new meaning. This is where postmodern comes from. Uh, so, so when the militant atheists like Hitchens accuse believers of picking and choosing, they are actually accusing them of being responsible believers. That is what faith is about, making a choice, venturing a wager, discriminating between rival interpretations in order to make the best decision regarding love and hate, justice and injustice. So you see here, um, he's, trying to, he's trying to celebrate this idea of sort of God of the gaps and how people are always changing their doctrinal understanding of, of text, which is basically Protestantism, right? I mean, the Protestant traditions, this is kind of what they're known for because of the sola scriptura, sola fide aspects and dimensions of their faith. So um, I want to wrap this video up, but what we see here is a total negation and rejection of a transcendent deity. So even though his book is titled Returning to God After God, there is no God we're returning to except for a phenomenological experience of nature and all. Um, evil basically doesn't, doesn't exist except if we have a transcendent deity because then when evil arises, well, that's the will of God. This is what Kearney's arguing. Totally ridiculous, right? Evil occurs in the absence of God, not because of God's will. Um this thing pretty much uh, supports a pragmatic understanding of truth, which there, therefore means it sort of functionalistic uh, relativism. It uh, totally negates the omnipotence of God. It is a re-enchantment of the world, picking up on the Frankfurt School and the critical theorist tradition of trying to uh, rediscover meaning through their sort of Marxist critical lens. And one of the things that he references uh, in sort of this re-enchantment um, well, at least what I think he's trying to do with this immense perennialism. And one of the things I didn't mention here is that he says, the Hindu Trimurti uh, might powerfully reinvigorate an understanding of Abraham's three strangers or three persons of the Trinity. Again, absolutely ridiculous. How can the Hindu Trimurti, which is Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Brahma the creator, Vishnu the preserver, Shiva the destroyer, and this triune understanding of the world, even though uh, Hinduism can be interpreted as monotheistic because of the overarching Brahma and because he's the creator, everything emerges from him. Therefore, there is a sort of monotheistic interpretation you can lay upon uh, sort of the pagan poly the polytheistic Hindu tradition. Um, that is totally different from the idea of a triune deity with one essence and three persons. 
you know, that's totally different from a transcendent all father that's mediated through his begotten son, the logos, which then represents all these different dimensions, these non-physical dimensions of reality. And it's through these non-physical dimensions that the physical dimension is actually organized. So, uh, definitely aren't the same. You know, the Hindu Trimurti is not going to reinvigorate our understanding of the Trinity. I think most people don't even understand the Trinity. And it certainly doesn't reinvigorate uh, Abraham's three strangers or the three angels that he hosts within his house. And this is another thing that I did not mention, but this whole book, this whole book is basically saying that the real reason of religion is to allow us to encounter the stranger and host and adopt and and uh, the alien and the other. And, and though I will agree that God is the holy other, it is totally ridiculous to uh, talk about how the real purpose of religion is for us to, to be open to the other. And again, you can see how this is a con- continuation of this sort of relativism, right? Because perennialism itself is relativism because religious traditions at fun- fundamentally are different and then superficially are the same. This is one of the things that I've come to the realization of, having been a sort of perennialist, you know, in the line of Huxley and the perennialistic philosophy and all this stuff, thinking because I was approaching religion through a semiotic lens, through archetypes, through symbols, through myths, saying, oh, well, look, here's uh, here's solar symbolism, here's this, here's this date, here's this festival, here's this thing. It must mean that they're all the same. But that can't be the case. You know, a tradition that says there's a soul and therefore says there's not a soul is not the same. A tradition that's uh, their, their chronology is cyclical versus one that has a beginning, a middle, end is not the same. Uh, a tradition that believes language actually reflects reality is different from one that doesn't. That's not the same. And so the fact that within religion people try to support perennialism is absolutely ridiculous because we don't do that within philosophy. We don't say empiricism is the same thing as idealism. No, they're actually totally distinct ideas and they are not the same. So whenever somebody's starting trying to do a sort of perennialistic take on religion, you basically can dismiss them and start trying to fit them within these sort of worldviews and paradigms and presuppositions and see where they're trying to take you because anybody who's being honest they can't be perennialistic. And so the whole ecumenical tradition where Christianity, the Pope, all these different churches are trying to uh, get in relations, conversations with other religious traditions, uh, it, it's stupid. It's, it's nonsensical. And if religious traditions actually just supported what they teach and promoted those things, and then we could have honest debates, I think... I feel very confident that Christianity would always come up on top. But um, so the, throughout this thing, he has all these symbolic interpretations of trying to show how really all the religions are the same. And it's all about us being open and accepting uh, God or the other or the stranger or the alien. And I just totally disagree with most of this stuff. So that's basically where I'm going to leave it, is that this book is perennialistic. It claims that evil doesn't exist outside domatic religion. Oh, he also continues on and on about Judeo-Christianity, Judeo-Christianity. No, there is no such thing as Judeo-Christianity. I'm so sick of this. Talmudic Judaism has totally different presuppositions than Christianity, and they are not the same. And Israel are Christians, and Christians are the chosen people. I don't want to hear this nonsense about Judaism and the chosen people and Zionism and the state of Israel. Israel is Christianity. This is very clear within the New Testament. And that uh, the Jews who actually converted and became Christians, that is the real tradition. And what was left with Judaism is just the Pharisees trying to uh, recast their tradition in a way to maintain power, which is what we would call Talmudic Judaism. That's at least my interpretation. So this book basically promotes paganism because of the transcendent, because the resistance to any sort of transcendent God. It talks about how God must be in the world, must be in the world. Well, that's ridiculous, and that is paganism, and that is pantheism, um, and that is what he's basically promoting. And he also has that any in-group, out-group distinction is a sort of negative. And so you can see this lack of any sort of boundary, any in-group, out-group boundary related to a sort of under undergirding relativism and a doing away and a, a, a dissolution of boundaries, which he's already 
been doing throughout this whole book. So in summary, this entire book, I think, stands in opposition to the reason why so many young people, uh, millennials and Gen Zers, are returning back to Christianity, back to traditionalism, rediscovering meaning, rediscovering truth, rediscovering family and uh, values that are real and that are centrally important and that are what you're going to think about when this life passes by, essentially. You know, it's going to be about your relationships, your children, your parents, your family, and the good that you did, how you treated people. And so for us being Christians, we're all judged after our death. And this is true with all religious traditions. If you want to get in perennialism, I mean, even to get out of moksha within Hinduism, you have to be judged to a degree. Uh, Same thing with nirvana and Buddhism. Uh, Obviously, you have to be judged in the other Abrahamic traditions. But even being rooted in Egyptian tradition, that's what it was all about, is the weighing of your soul. And so after this life, this is one of the things that came to me on one of my ayahuasca experiences, is that we're absolutely judged at the end of this life. That's the whole point. And that's why the standard of our judgment is Jesus Christ and the Logos. And it is through that standard in which we should aspire to live. And uh, therefore, we have objective truth. We have real truth. And, and what we do matters. And the way we treat people and the things that we say matter. They matters a lot. And you can see how, again, just that framing is in opposition to Richard Kearney's anatheism. So I am in favor of anatheism. And the first time I heard anatheism was actually from Rupert Sheldrake, and I have that video on my other YouTube channel. If you just put in Rupert Sheldrake anatheism, you'll see that pop up on YouTube. But uh, I do support anatheism, and I like using that term, and I think uh, us young people who are returning back to Christianity, who are using Logos theology to rediscover meaning in in the Western tradition, to use anatheism as a real term, but to understand uh, what all this stuff means and be on the lookout for people like Richard Kearney or the whole kind of academic critical theorist tradition. So with that being said, I'm going to conclude this video. Uh, Thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for supporting me. Please let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Um, I greatly appreciate everything you guys say and the feedback that I get. Uh, Thank you very much for everything. I truly, truly appreciate it and I love you guys. And as always, until next time, God bless.